Good morning. Let's try that one more time. Good morning. Very good. So first of all, for those that have come in from abroad, thank you for making the journey. Welcome to Spain. Bienvenido a Valencia to everybody else. Welcome to the 2018 Fiber to the Home Conference. I think it was very apparent there listening to the minister, the pride that Spain has in the infrastructure that it's built out over the last number of years. I think the vision that we've seen being shown from Spain's leadership, but not only that, as the minister touched on as well, the vision that they've had with regard to their regulatory policy has been hugely important in allowing the operators to then take that vision and to have the courage to work with the investment community to build out an infrastructure in a time frame that almost seems ridiculous. If you think about it, Spain has gone from zero to hero status on the European fiber to the home penetration scale in what feels like no time at all. If we think about how long we've been building out fiber infrastructures across Europe, it's a fantastic achievement. I think the vision and the pride that we see here in Spain today, coupled with the venue that we have here, the city of Valencia, the food, the people, and you'll note we even booked the weather for you. I think we're setting ourselves up to have the best conference that we've ever had. So once again, welcome to everybody. On the topic of visionaries, society needs future visionaries. We need people that can change the game, that can alter society, that can elevate their vision above what the naysayers say can't be done. It's absolutely critical that we have those visionaries. However, it's not uncommon for visionaries to predicate their view based on past experiences. So what they predict for the future is what they've seen before. And to use an analogy to try and describe just how silly that sometimes can be, a friend of mine gave me a good analogy there recently where he spoke about it's a little bit like trying to give instruction to a blindfolded driver of a car while you look out the rear window as he drives. It all goes reasonably well, so long as there's no major changes or surprises. And that's one of the challenges that we have. Quite often, the visionaries that we have that dictate, you know, when they're asked questions about, why do you need fiber? Who needs gigabit connectivity? And we hear these assertions that come from people based on past experience. And unfortunately, our industry is littered with many, many examples over the years. I have a few to share with you this morning. If we take, for example, Sir William Priest, chief engineer of the British Post Office back in 1878. And Sir William, his views were very much cemented in what had been working to date. When he was asked about what he thought of the telephone, this new innovation that was coming from the Americas, his response was very clearly cemented in the past. He spoke about how the Americans have a need for the telephone, but we do not. We've got plenty of messenger boys. I wonder what Sir William would think of today's modern communication world. I wonder how many messenger boys would be needed to deal with the 500 million tweets a day that Twitter deals with. I think he was a little bit short-sighted possibly in his vision. Another example is Ken Olson, President, Chairman and CEO of Digital Equipment Corporation, or DEC as they were known. For those of you that are old enough to remember DEC, they were the ones that brought a real challenge to IBM and the mainframe computer space. Now, for the record, I'm not old enough to remember them, but I've read up on them. And one of the interesting things with DEC is people often ask, what happened? How did it all go wrong? You know, there was a massive market available for them, and yet their demise happened very quickly. And to quote Professor Clayton Christensen of Harvard, they got disrupted. They didn't spot the threat that was coming to their business until it was too late, and then when they tried to pivot through acquisition, they had already missed the market. Ken, at the time, was busy evangelizing to the industry, trying to convince them that there was no reason anybody would want a computer within their home. Now, personally, I agree with Ken, and I think I'll talk about some of the, these topics later on in the, in the talk, that I think we will very rapidly transition away from having that big lump of plastic and glass taking up space and using power within our homes. But that's for completely different reasons to what Ken envisaged at the time. My favorite example, if you go back to the 1990s, my now brother-in-law, who was an architect at the time, arrived home from work one day. He'd just taken receipt 
of a new computer to help him with his job and he was full of pride, he was beaming. He says, I just got this new computer today. And he was trying to sound exotic. He says, it's called a Sunspark station. Now, this was back in the time when I had an Epson 286 with one meg of RAM and a 20 meg hard drive. 20 meg, you couldn't even fit one photograph on that nowadays. And he went on to tell us about how all the software comes on this disc called a CD-ROM. Now, this was just before music CDs had gone mainstream. And each CD-ROM holds 640 meg of data, to which you receive the response you see on the screen there. Sure, that's stupid. Who'd need that much storage on their computer? The person who said that, the person who said that was me back in 1990. <laughs> and the reason I give that example, it's very important to remember that each and every one of you probably have your own personal examples of where we've been short-sighted with regard to what we think is going to happen in the future. And I think it's absolutely critical that we remind ourselves when we're questioning, we see a new innovation coming through. We see a new breakthrough in the technology that will allow tens of gigabits in the future, and we're going, that's stupid, who'd need that? We have to remind ourselves there will be applications that will come in the future and take advantage of that. We don't have the gift of clairvoyance, and we shouldn't pretend that we do. We can't predict, predict the future. That said, today, I will make a couple of predictions of my own during the presentation. If we look at some of the major trends that are happening, one of the big trends that's happening across the industry and across the consumer electronics space is the shift towards the cloud augmentation of everything. Up on the left-hand side, we've got the cloud there, trying to articulate what was the overnight success that took 20 years of software as a service. And software as a service, if we think about most of the software that we use today, most of the software we take as a service from the cloud. It only has its full capability available when we're connected. Some of the software doesn't work at all unless you're connected. And that's the model as we go forward in the future. The days of installing stuff on your local PC and that's you done, that's the end of the commercial relationship, those days are over and they've been over for quite a while. We've got companies like Toy Talk, and Toy Talk is doing a really good example of where they're taking inanimate objects that our children play with and our children learn with, and they're augmenting them with artificial intelligence from the cloud, so they become much more interactive and allow our children to learn much, much faster. Up in the top right-hand side, we all know the robots are coming. They're coming for our jobs, but the reality is when you see robots like up on the right-hand side, uh, that's Asimo, and ASIMO is the fruition of 20 years of research by the Honda company. Very sophisticated robot, could make his way through this environment and meet and greet people and walk his way up the stairs, etc. The challenge with ASIMO is ASIMO carries around a supercomputer on his back. If robots are ever going to make their way into society and help our elderly and clean our houses and do the ironing and all the other jobs I'm trying to get rid of, if they're ever going to interact that way, we've got to democratize that technology. And the only way we can do that is take that supercomputer that's needed to give them the information and calculate how they navigate their way around and how they communicate with us, and to share it, and to share it amongst all the robotic devices there so we get scale economies that go with that. But in order for that to work, we need extremely low latency and extremely high capacity connectivity that only really fiber can deliver. You'll see out on the floor, there'll be lots of examples of virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality. I prefer the phrase extended reality because we're very rapidly moving towards a scenario where it's all going to come together. All the five senses will be capable of being fooled as we go forward by artificial stimulus, basically. But if you think about the impact of that, the visuals that go with it are going to require extremely high bandwidth, and I'll talk about more about that later on. But then when we think about things like haptic feedback for a remote touch control, the latency requirements around that are extremely challenging. Or if we want to try and reduce nausea, things like jitter, you know, the latency needs to be consistent, but it also needs to be very short as well. And fiber is the best solution to allow that to happen in a remote fashion. We're also seeing how the world engages with compute technology and how it accesses knowledge within the, within the, the cloud, within the internet is changing. We're moving away from the era that we all grew up with, where we engaged with compute resources and we accessed information through keyboards, mice, and screens. We're now moving into a world where voice control is coming to the fore. And I go so far as to make the assertion that, you know, the, the, the children being born here in Spain today will probably never master keyboard skills. 
because they'll speak to the compute resources. They'll use gesture control to guide those resources on what it is that they're trying to achieve. And if you look at the companies that are backing that, you've got the biggest technology companies in the world all over this, pumping hundreds of millions into it, because they recognize this is the future of search. This is the future of shopping. This is the future of how we engage. But if I take away the connectivity, all of those things along the bottom row of the screen are dumb as bricks. They don't work. So we need very reliable connectivity. So I said I was going to make a couple of predictions today. Here's my first. In the gigabit society, the need for the vast majority of consumers to own a home computer will disappear. Our means of engagement with cloud-based information will transition from keyboard, mouse, and screen to voice and gesture control along with mixed reality displays. So that's the first one. How we consume information is changing as well. Traditionally, we read information, and reading is an extremely reliable means of distributing information, but unfortunately, it's a reasonably slow way of taking in information. For the engineers in the room, I throw up an example of the likes of the Haynes Manual. The engineers like to you know, service their own cars and that sort of thing. And just for the record, I'm a recovering engineer myself, so I can speak about this with some degree of knowledge. And what we're seeing is, I use the Haynes example very deliberately, because what we're seeing is a massive shift in the industry towards all knowledge being disseminated through video. There was a recent repost by one of my fellow board members, um, Tony from Prismium. And um, Tony, within that, um, Tony Bosch from Prismium, within that post that was up on LinkedIn, there was research done with regard to how Generation Z how they learn, how they best learn in an environment, how they consume information. And all I can say is, if it's not in video form, forget it. You're not going to secure the mind share of the youth that are growing up today. It's all about video. And the one thing that we can predict is that the video is going to increase in richness, and it's going to increase in volume. One of the interesting things, where video is a fantastic medium for us all to learn with, it's also great for entertainment as well. And thanks to things like YouTube and Vimeo, the entrance barriers for people bringing new video formats to the fore are, have never been lower. We've now seen new genres come through and have massive success, things that we never would have dreamt would have gained traction. And certainly, if it was left to the big six produ production studios globally, they never would have made it to our screens. But thanks to YouTube, et cetera, we've now got scenarios. Who in the audience, for example, has children that are addicted to unboxing channels? I remember my kids went through a phase of that. Or the latest in our household with my nine-year-old son is fails of the week. He loves nothing more than watching people fall off their BMX and hurt themselves. I know there's some of you out there who are addicted to cat channels. You don't have to put your hand up and reveal who you are. I know you're out there. But the reality is there's a long tail of different video formats gaining traction to very niche markets out there. And that tail is only going to continue to get longer. The media quality is only going to increase as we go up from 4K to 8K and into the future. We'll start to talk about things like 360 video. We can already stream 360 video. I think this session here has been recorded in 360 video as well. So this stuff is starting to go mainstream slowly but surely. On the topic of screen resolutions, on the chart, you probably can't read the chart behind me very well, but really what it talks about is how 35% of European households within the next two years are going to have an ultra-high-def TV in the household. And that's important for planners. One of the things I often hear planners when they're saying how much bandwidth are people going to need, they talk about you know, one 4K TV in the living room, a couple of high-def TVs dotted around the place, a few tablets and phones. We say about 50 meg, that should cover it. And they're so wrong. It's scary how wrong they are. If we think about the other trends that are happening within the industry, go down to any of the high street electronic stores and look at the high-end tablets that are available today. They've all got 4K screens built into them. All of the latest laptops and desktop computers, the screens are all 5K resolution. So when these devices stream content, they'll stream in much higher resolutions than what people really anticipate. Last year, so this is a year ago, at Mobile World Congress, Sony introduced their premium phone handset. And that came with a 4K screen. Now, you might ask, what do I need a 4K screen for on a handset? Is that for a sharper Netflix experience? It's not. The reality is the mobile gaming industry is worth $40 billion a year, $40 billion. And there's a massive genre coming to the fore within the mobile gaming industry in the form of virtual reality. 
Those of you that have tried virtual reality, one of the things that you'll realize very quickly is that once you get over the wow factor, you're looking around going, oh, this is fantastic, it works really well. After a minute or two, you get what they refer to as the screen door effect. It's like looking through a, an insect screen, you know, to, to stop insects flying into your home. And the reason being is because the resolution is very low and the screen is right up to your eyes. The human eye sees in 12K resolution. The headsets that are available today, the very leading edge within the mass market today are typically at around 4K resolution. And in that scenario with 4K, when it's up to, that close to your eyes, you can still see all the pixels, etc. The screen that I show up there, the virtual reality headset, is by a company called Vario. They're a Finnish company. Delighted to see a European company taking the charge here. And they've recognized the fact that the human eye sees in 12K, and they're taking the lead in that. They've created a headset that can replicate that experience for the users. So now you're getting into an environment when you do virtual reality, it actually feels real. It feels like you're in the room here. You can't see pixels anymore. Think about the bandwidth that's going to be required for that. And that then extends onto things like augmented reality and mixed reality. When we think about those technologies, we tend to think about very basic graphic overlays, like somebody's name above their head or turn-by-turn -turn navigation. But there's no reason why that won't be every bit as rich from a graphics perspective as what we see in the virtual reality world. So my second prediction for today is the need for ever-increasing broadband capacity will continue indefinitely underpinned by the increases in media richness and screen quantities over the coming decades. Anything that can be augmented by a screen as we go forward will be, and it'll be a very high resolution screen as well. One of the things we need to think about within the industry, quite often we get distracted by some of the sexier use cases, you know, the autonomous vehicles, the connected cars, etc. And while they're going to have a massive impact on society when they do arrive, we also need to think about some of the other things that are going to have a very large impact. Things like, you know, Europe's enterprises, Europe's manufacturing industry. And the reality is, you know, increasingly because of globalization, we have to compete on a global stage. And those companies that cannot really focus in on their core competencies. What makes their products better than the next guy's products? The ones that really don't bring that focus and allow them to themselves to get distracted by all the things that are not core to their business, they're not going to succeed in the long term. And to that end, it's absolutely critical that we need to be thinking about, you know, things like the IT infrastructure that causes a lot of distraction in many businesses today. Thanks to increasingly ubiquitous fiber connectivity, particularly here in countries like Spain, in France, in Portugal, in the Nordics, we now have the real capability to take those things that are not core, just like we don't service our own vehicles anymore for within our companies. Likewise, for that IT infrastructure to move that to people that that is their core competence. The likes of the Amazon Web Services of this world, the Azures of this world, they, their core competency is running web scale, high availability IT infrastructure. Why should we let our businesses get distracted from what we should be focused on to ensure that we're successful in the future? Infrastructure as a service is only really now becoming a reality because of the increasing penetration of fiber out there. And as we get more fiber out there, that will become within reach of everybody. How we learn, how we research, how we diagnose is improving all the time. The tools that we have available to us now have never been better. And those tools, as I mentioned earlier, are increasingly being augmented by connectivity to the cloud. Those of you who have kids in the room, looking at the demographic, I suspect that's a, that's a reasonable amount of us within the room here. We know we can't get away with giving poor connectivity to our digital native children. In the future, this will be classed as a form of neglect. Just like depriving children of education, if you deprive them of that connectivity to the world, that will be frowned upon within society. Those who cannot access digital learning and e-health, they're going to be left behind versus their peers on the global stage. They're going to struggle to catch up. The divides in the future as we go forward will be the divides between the digitally impoverished versus the digitally empowered. Today, sometimes, I don't know if we get them here in Spain, certainly in the Irish market, every so often we'll hear ads on the radio trying to encourage that very small percentage of society that still are faced with challenges around literacy, 
to face their fears and learn how to read and write because it's a life skill, it's absolutely critical. I think in the future as we go forward, digital literacy will hear similar ads for those few people that get left behind. Former Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld frequently spoke about known knowns, known unknowns, and unknown unknowns. And in this world where we've got very good predictability with regard to population growth and population location, where people settle, where they grow their families, etc. With that visibility, doesn't it make a whole lot of sense to plan for critical infrastructures in advance? If you picture a scenario like what we've got on the screen there, where we've got a major power outage across a city, that happens from time to time. But could you imagine that lasting for a week or a month? It'd be unthinkable, right? There'd be civil unrest if that was left to be the situation. Now picture those of us with kids in the 8 to 18 bracket in our house if we lost broadband connectivity completely for a week or a month. The likelihood is they'd probably move out. Maybe there's a cunning plan in there, actually, to get rid of them. <laughs> Recently, I was doing some router upgrades at home. I was changing out parts of the Wi-Fi infrastructure and upgrading the, the firmware on the router, and I had to go through a number of reboots to get all the changes I wanted it to take effect to happen. And I noticed the first couple of times that I went through it that very quickly I was getting the, Dad, the Wi-Fi is not working, coming down the stairs at me. And I said, oh, this is interesting. So as I went through it all, I started to time it, and I went through about another five or six reboots to get everything the way I wanted it done. And the average time it took for me when I hit the reboot button on the software interface for the computer to when I got that, Dad, the Wi-Fi is not working, was 12 seconds. <laughs> 12 seconds. The phone could be broken for a month, and they'd never notice. Now think about it, when we were their age, if we had no phone for a month, we would have been cut off from society. And this is very important because our digital pipe now connects us to the rest of the world. It's mission critical and increasingly so as we go forward. So because we've got very clear visibility of what is needed as we go forward from a population perspective, things like water treatment facilities, things like hospital and A&E wards, things like education facilities, things like roads, things like electricity, some of the things that the minister spoke about. Isn't it critically important we plan for those? But most importantly, it's critically important we plan for the digital infrastructure that's going to be needed to meet the needs of our children and our grandchildren as we go forward. And I say most importantly because, you know, sure, if the electricity goes out for a week or two, that's hugely serious and probably more important than if the digital infrastructure goes out because it's life impacting. But the digital infrastructure has the capability to transform society, to make our economies run much more efficiently, to make our lives run much more efficiently. And efficiency, as the world population moves towards 8 billion, is becoming an increasingly critical topic for every single one of us, but not just us, for our children and our grandchildren and their children as we go forward. Within Europe, there's targets to drive efficiency. There's targets to push energy utilization down by 20%. And the digital infrastructure will underpin that. That will drive an awful lot of that change as we go forward, whether it's by closer communication between vehicles as we go forward, whether it's smart homes that stop energy being wasted when we're not around, or the smart offices, or whether it's electrical generation that's only turned on as and when it's needed and where it's needed, and turned off very, very quickly accordingly. I once heard a statistic there recently where somebody was saying up to 60% of energy produced is wasted because they don't have enough control on that, and building a fiber-rich society will allow them to avoid that. Picture a city congested with traffic. One of the statistics that floats around is typically at any given time, up to 30% of those vehicles are looking for parking. So 30% are adding to the problem. If you took 30% off the road, you probably wouldn't have the traffic in the first place. But picture in the future as we go forward, if true cloud connectivity, artificial intelligence, and ubiquitous wireless coverage that is connected to a very low latency, high reliability fiber infrastructure. We could guide those vehicles proactively based on where they're trying to get to, to the nearest available parking space. And all the inefficiencies that exist with that begin to disappear. Think about if we could take our goods transport industry and we could start to pontoon vehicles together, just like what we do with trains today. We all know the aerodynamic efficiencies that go with trains versus individual trucks on a road. 
But what if I could drive non-stop from one end of Europe to the other at a constant speed, not speeding up, not slowing down, how much more efficient would that be from an energy utilization point of view? But in order to do that, you have to think about the connectivity, the connectivity between the trucks, the connectivity between the trucks and all the other vehicles on the road, all of the traffic light signals along the journey, the railway crossings that they have to cross over, etc. In order to realize that vision, massive densification and wireless infrastructure is going to be required. And to the minister's point, without that massive densification in fiber infrastructure to backhaul all that wireless, it's simply not going to happen. Think about it today. How many of you in the audience today, 45 years after the first mobile phone call was made, today still can't drive from your home to your office and make a call without it dropping along the way? Now, thankfully, those figures are improving, but I'm pretty sure there's still a number of you out there that are in that situation, that you're running through black spots all the time. Massive densification is required. If we're ever going to achieve that densification, we need to change our attitude with regard to the investment community. The investment community have no shortage of opportunities of things that they can invest in. The European telecoms market is just one of them. And if we sit there and we get greedy about it and say, oh, well, we're not really willing to put in place you know, the regulatory environments to give them certainty on investment, and we only want them to have you know, a certain return on that, they'll just go off to one of the other opportunities that they have available. And if those funds don't come into our market, the infrastructures will not get built. So we have to change our mindset with that. We have to think about rewarding those that are willing to make the investments needed to deliver the fiber densification that's required that will allow things like the 5Gs of this world to happen. My third prediction for today. Despite the assertions that we will never achieve the full fiber goal, this will be achieved. The ever accelerating pace of innovation coupled with the cloud augmentation of everything, we'll see fiber prevail as the sensible choice for the astute investor. We have to think about it like an ecosystem. The fiber is the soil. It's the roots from which everything is going to grow in the future. Without fiber, there will be no 5G. I'll put that up there as one of the predictions. You know, that's, that's not a light assertion that I make. If we don't get massive fiber densification, all of the visions that go with 5G, all of those use cases we've all heard about, will not happen. Without fiber, our factories will continue to underperform versus their peers on a global stage. Make no mistake about it, the European economy is in decline versus its peers on the global stage. And we need to correct that. We need to take some serious action to turn that around. Without fiber, our rural communities will continue to have to offer up their best and their brightest to the cities because they can't get work in their hometowns where they grow up. We need to change that. How long are we willing to face being digitally impoverished? Five years? 10, 15, 20? We need to change it right here and now. Now, thankfully, there is change occurring within Europe. We're seeing examples of people who've taken an early lead and are really driving that change. If we look at the examples like the Nordics, if we look at Portugal, if we look at Spain where we are here now, France is getting on board with it. Heaven forbid, even the UK now is starting to make all the right signals. And just while I'm on that topic, for the Fibre to the Home Council, I'm delighted to see that we now have today, we got permission last night to announce that one of our newest members who's just joined is one of the operators from the UK. So welcome on board to City Fibre and Greg and the team, I know you're in there somewhere. Welcome on board, congratulations. I firmly believe that those invest he who invest heavily in the fibre infrastructure, they're gonna be the first ones to benefit from 5G. They're going to be the first ones to benefit from things like autonomous vehicles and e-learning, etc. They're going to be the ones who will understand what it's like to live in a fiber-rich, 5G-enabled, smart city. And they're going to be the ones that are going to see a flurry of startup companies emerge that can take advantage of that, take advantage of that early knowledge and set themselves apart on the global stage. We can't afford U-turns with this. Ubiquity is key. There's no point in us having a patchwork of connectivity. 
If I, you know, if, I, if my monitored health only works in one state and doesn't work in another, if the pontooning trucks can only go in one country but not across borders, it all falls apart really quickly. The business cases don't work. It has to be ubiquitous. We can't afford short-term thinking with this. We can't afford short-term investment with it. We can't afford U-turns. It's too late if you're planning for a problem that's already here and now in front of you. You need to be planning well in ahead. Going back to Rumsfeld that we touched on earlier, where he spoke about the known knowns. There's enough known knowns in front of us today. If we're to avoid scenes like this, where people clamber over each other in search of the elusive 5G signal in the future. Sorry, I couldn't resist. <laughs> now, all joking aside though, 5G. IoT, extended reality, these are all known knowns today, okay? How much fiber infrastructure do we need even just to make them happen? Now, how many of you in the audience would have predicted that Pokemon Go could go from zero to 50 million simultaneous users in 12 days? None of you, including me, okay? It's the unknown unknowns that we need to be planning for. And that's where fiber comes into play. Fiber is the only medium that can allow us to scale when we need to scale. It's the only one that will allow us to climb and to reach those new heights. So I'll close with this. We can provide all the recommendations we want. We can provide all the use cases and case studies. The challenge we've got is if local governments will not recognize that fiber densification absolutely needs to happen, if they're not willing to face down those seeking to preserve the status quo, if they will not lead their countries towards a future of digital abundance, they are sentencing their citizens to a life of being a second-class digital citizen on the global stage. Whenever I hear, when I go out and meet customers, etc., and whenever I hear the stories about how people in country X, Y, and Z, for discretion reasons, they're very frugal. They'll only buy the bandwidth that they need. They've no need for gigabit. They've no need for fiber connectivity. The immediate response that screams out in my head is, where is the leadership? Think about Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs often was quoted as saying, you can't ask the consumers what they want. They can't imagine it. You have to show them. And it's only then when you show them, they realize, oh, wow, that's cool. I really love that and then he's held up as a hero for bringing these products to market. And it's the exact same situation with full fiber. The other 98% of the population that's not here today, they can't imagine what this new capability will bring for them. And that's where we have to guide them. That's where the industry has to provide leadership. That's where the politicians have to provide leadership. Full fiber starts locally. The EU Commission, the local governments, the national regulators, they have a duty of care. They have a duty of care to you, to you, to you, to all of you up there to ensure that you, your children, your grandchildren do not become the digitally impoverished as we go forward into the future. Every single one of you has a responsibility to work within your communities to drive awareness about the importance of this crit critical infrastructure. You have a duty of care yourselves to push your local politicians and to push your parliamentarians within Europe to ensure that they're demanding nothing less than you have the infrastructure that will allow you and your family to become the digitally empowered as we go forward. So much gracias, enjoy Valencia, and enjoy the conference. Thank you very much. <laughs>